Good to be back this morning as we come together to study God's Word, this first lesson of the hour, which I look at it as a time that we have come together to think about things spiritual. All through the week we have times where we're thinking about work and concentrating, focus on things that are necessary, like our jobs and such, but here's a time we have dedicated for God. That's what I want to talk about today is our subject is from the Word of God. And the lesson of the hour is embracing the promises of God. And our lesson text is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. So we look at the book of Hebrews as the great faith chapter. And it is talking about people of great faith and what they did in great service to God. And he's talking about some who, because of their faith, they didn't get to see all the promises fulfilled in their lifetime. That's really what Hebrews 13, actually 11, 13, 14 speaking to. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And we're talking about people of the Old Testament. And they had a lot of things that were against them. That they suffered many things. But they also stood firm in their faith. And that because what got them through the difficult times. I believe was the promises of God. And that's the same thing for you and I today. It changes our lives when we embrace the promises of God. And I really want you to think about it from this perspective. Have you individually, you yourself, have you embraced the promises of God like it says about these people of faith? If you have not, it's time that we do embrace these promises of God in our lives because it will absolutely change our lives when we do so. I want to talk about, first of all, the nature of God's promises. When you think about what is a promise, it is an agreement, it's something said with the intention of keeping that promise. It's something we fulfill, isn't it? So we think about the promises of God, what He says He always fulfills. And I think also we can look at a covenant as a promise. When God gave the covenant or the promise to Abraham, there's actually a good story. I heard a lesson one time on cutting a covenant. They would actually cut an animal and both would walk through both sides of that animal right between the midst of that animal like God did with Abraham as he cut a covenant with, with Abraham literally in some regard. And so he agreed. He made promises to Abraham. In chapter 12, chapter 17, he talks about the, these promises. Then there's Moses who's given the law and everything about the law, most of the mosaical system. In some ways, it's the way God would act with his people. As there are certain promises that he makes. With the Old Testament worthies of, of men like Moses and Aaron. And all the Joshua and all the men who lived at that time. And all those men lived under God's agreement. His promises. And then we come to Christ. And then we see that also fulfilled. The idea of these these promises that we have in Christ. That's what you and I enjoy today. The nature of God's promises as a covenant. In Galatians chapter 3, 15 to 18, here's what Paul says. It says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant. Yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one. And to your seed who is in Christ. Who is Christ. And this I say that the law which was 430 years later. Cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ. That it should be. That should make the promise of no effect. Or if inheritance is of the law. It is no longer a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. And he uses the word promise several times in that reading. And he's talking about how the fact that the original promise to Abraham under the patriarchal age, even though the Mosaical age came in because it was added because of sin, transgressions, would not annul or disavow what he said to Abraham. That's God kept that promise that all nations would be blessed 
through the seed of, of Abraham, which was Christ. And in Hebrews 8, verse 6, he says about Christ, he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Again, he's speaking to us today about the better promises. And we think about all the great promises Abraham had and of the law of Moses. We have experienced better promises in the sense of the forgiveness of sins and God working with us in the ways that he does even in the New Testament age. But I also want to say the reason why we can look at the nature of God's promises and see, you know, God says this, but will he fulfill this? Well, it's all rooted to his character, isn't it? When you make a promise with someone, you don't want to make a promise uh, something they have to fulfill if they have an unsavory or untrustworthy character. But we don't have to worry about that with God. God always is faithful. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 tells us about that. And he's talking about our faithfulness here, how we need to be faithful. He says, let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And he also calls upon the fact God doesn't waver. For he who promised is faithful. That's why we don't have to waver here one day, gone the next, because God is faithful. We should not be like that. Our faithfulness should not be just one day and it is gone. But it should always be like God in that respect. It's always there, always faithful. And then we see, I didn't use the scripture, Hebrews 11, verse 11. Let's talk about how Sarah judged him to be faithful. And so she understood this promise of a son as something she could trust in because God is trustworthy. Numbers 23 verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will not make it good? This reminded the people about the fact that God it's not like a man, the fact that he can change his mind or vacillate or even lie and deceive. No, God is, as we understand, all-knowing, all-powerful, and ever-present. But even more than that, he's all-holy and righteous and there's justice and without sin. So therefore, God cannot lie. That's really what Titus 1 verse 2 says, the fact that God, who cannot lie, promised us eternal life. And so God is trustworthy. He's worthy of our trust because of that. <clears throat> but not only that, God is able to deliver the promises. In Romans chapter 4, verse 21, the Bible speaks about, again, about Abraham and how when he was told to offer his son Isaac and take him on the mountain and, and to offer him as a sacrifice. Well, he understood that was the only son. He was the son of promise that he had waited years to receive. And yet, he was willing to do that. And why was it? Because he was then realized God is able. Notice the verse that says, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Even if he had to take his own son and take him to the mountain and sacrifice him. In chapter 11, verse 17, the Bible tells us there, by faith Abraham when was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. And so again, it tells us, Abraham knew he had so much faith in God. It said, even if he had to raise Isaac from the dead, if I kill him on the mount. God is able to raise him from the dead. That was going through Abraham's mind. That's why he's called the father of our faith in a lot of ways, because of the faithful, because of his great faith he had in God. And we need to have that same kind of, of faith in God today, that God is able to do every promise that he has ever made to us in our lives. But I also want to suggest that God's promises are conditional. There's where sometimes people will say, well, you know, or how can a promise be conditional? Well, God puts, puts conditions on these. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, when they were going into the promised land, actually this is the second reading of the law, that's what Deuteronomy refers to, and here Moses is reminding them that this is conditional. 
your good fortune, your blessings from God, his giving the land and all that, is not something you did yourself. It's not something that's irreversible either. In verses 1 through, one through 4 it says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that, the, that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. And with that blessing, that great blessing, all that being said, notice verses 14 and 15. These are words of warning. You know, earlier he said, don't forget, lest you forget the one who gave you all these blessings. But notice what he says, you shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you, for the Lord your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you off the face of the earth. Well, I thought God gave us eternal life and never taken away from us. Well, these, again, these promises were conditional to Israel. The same could be true with us as we come to the New Testament. Colossians 1, 23, just one passage of many passages we could talk about. I chose just to do one. Here Paul says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. And so what is Paul saying here? That word if makes it conditional, doesn't it? If you do this then you still have this reward. You still have the hope of the gospel, which is heaven itself, which is the promise of God. But we can be moved away from the hope of the gospel. And we have examples of that. We don't have to go uh, into all that. But we understand God's promises are conditional. But then we come to the point here in the lesson. Here's why I want to center in it for a while. What are the promises that God makes with us? Ever thought about that? Ever thought, well, I know that God makes promises, but how many apply to me today? There's a book, All the Promises of the Bible, by Herbert Lockyer. And he has approximately about 8,000, I think it's around seven to 8,000 promises. That's off the back of the book there. I don't actually have this book. But he's a writer who makes several of these books, All the Prayers in the Bible or of the Bible. Uh, he has several in that series. Well, here he lists about 8,000. We think, well, does that mean, does God have that many for us today? And the question comes, do all the pro promises of the Bible apply to us today? Well, let's look at some of them very briefly. The promise of deliverance from a flood he gave to Noah. We know the context was for Noah and, and only for him in Genesis chapter 6. But then chapter 9 with the rainbow, well, that still applies to us because we still have that covenant. That's one that goes beyond the, the mosaical age. Even today, we, when, the rain, when the rain comes and we see that rainbow, just like Genesis 9, 13 to 16 states, God still honors that covenant that he will not bring a flood on the earth again to destroy the world. And so again, in some ways, we still have promises from back, way back then, but then there's some not for us. We don't have to go build an ark today. Why? Because that was for Noah. God says, I'm not going to build it. I'm not going to bring a flood on the earth. Then the promise of a son to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, he talks about that, that how he would give him a son in his old age. Well, that's, again, that's not a promise for us because that happened to Abraham. But then we also think about how does it apply to us? Well, that we are our benefits of the seed of Abraham, his descendant, which was of Christ in chapter 22, verse 18. The Bible speaks to that. It says, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. We still receive the, the blessings from that. What Christ did for us because of what Abraham, that promised son Isaac, led to the descendant of Christ. Without that son Isaac, 
We think, well, he had to have Isaac before he could have any descendants, right? And so that's what led to having Christ as our Savior. Then there's the land promises to Israel. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, the Bible says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. He's talking about in the land of Canaan, where, where, where Abraham was. And so these land promises were fulfilled. You read Joshua chapter 21, 43 to 45. He says that, So the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelled in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all they had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of their, all their enemies stood against him. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. And then we think about the come, coming Savior, the promise of that. And we live in that, we might say, the, the post age of Christ. He's already came to the world. We look back 2,000 years, approximately, the time Jesus came. But when Moses wrote Deuteronomy 18, 18, it was still future. That promise has been fulfilled. Isaiah 9, verse 6, by the son that was given to us, all that's been fulfilled. And so those are some of the promises. What are some of the promises today? We think about what the Bible says about him being a father to us. That's a great blessing. And that's a promise to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 to 18, Notice again, it's a conditional promise. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. He's speaking to us today. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. In a lot of ways, the churches of denominationalism has missed the mark on this. They've embraced sin in a lot of ways. Especially, you might say, with the marriage, things like that, the same-sex marriage. When they embrace that, they are absolutely not listening to what God says about this. And so he says, do not touch what is unclean. I'll receive you. I'll be a father to you. And you should be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Well, how do we know that's a promise? The word promise is not there. If you go to chapter 7, verse 1. You know, sometimes these chapter breaks are unfortunate. He's still continuing that thought. He says, therefore, having these promises, beloved. And so he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filth of the flesh and spirit, perfecting wholeness in the fear of God. So God's a father to us in that way. We also have life in Christ. St. Timothy 1, verse 1 says, Paul, as he begins his letter to Timothy by saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. We have life. Isn't that what Jesus said in John chapter 10? That I came to give them life, give it to them more abundantly. That's what we have in Christ. The abundant life of the spiritual nature of life. Not just physical life, but spiritual life. Then there's the crown of life. That's mentioned in James chapter 1, verse 12. The brother of our Lord actually said this. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has, has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Again, that's conditional. If we don't <laughs> love the Lord, if we're not following him, in other words, you know, the love of the Lord is keep his commandments. John 14, 15 tells us that. And so we have to be a part of his will and his ways in order to receive this promise. We have to endure temptation as well to receive that crown of life. Then there's the rest for our souls. Remember John chapter, actually Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 31 speaks about that rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls. Well, Hebrews 4, 1, verse 4, 1 says, Therefore, since a promise remains of injuring his rest. So we have to come to that rest. We do it because we're following Jesus. And again, that's a conditional promise, isn't it? We think about the eternal inheritance. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 says this. 
about Christ being the meter of the new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption for the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. The Bible says several times that we are heirs in Christ, that we are receiving an inheritance. <clears throat> That's why we have to be faithful as a son and not be outcast, not be disqualified from this eternal inheritance. Then there's eternal life, which is very similar to the eternal inheritance. 1 John chapter 2, 25 says this, And this is the promise. What promise, John? That he has promised us <coughs> eternal life. And so that's, again, something that God holds out for us in the sense of a promise that we can have if we simply will meet the conditions. We'll do what God says. Do his will <coughs> in order to be saved. Then there's the heavenly kingdom that James chapter 2, verse 5 mentions says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? And that goes back to the idea of loving God, doesn't it? And when we love God, we are ones who are following him and doing his will. We receive the kingdom. St. Peter 1, 10 and 11 says, if we add these things to our lives, <coughs> faith, virtue, knowledge, all that, he says we'll give an abundant entrance into the heavenly kingdom, the eternal kingdom. It refers to it as an everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's really what Jesus was saying in John chapter 14, verses 2 and through 4. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And he's talking for that place we call heaven as an eternal kingdom, which will be a part of that heavenly kingdom there. Well, here's the part we'll look at today. All this has been academic. We've been talking about things we know. But I want to suggest, make this personal to you, an application. How can we embrace these promises of God? First of all, by looking to the future promise of heaven. Go back to our lesson text. Hebrews chapter 11, 13 and 14. He's talking about people who died in faith and not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. You know, sometimes it may be that heaven may be afar off for us. I mean, think, well, that's way off in the future. Well, it's really not as far as, far as our obligations are concerned. It's not as far off as we really think, because we're going to meet Jesus in about two ways, either when death comes or Jesus comes <clears throat> back, you might say, to receive us up to him. And so we have to be looking at these promises. Well, are we looking toward the future promise of heaven? Is that what we're living for? It needs to be, doesn't it? And that's really what embracing this promise means. Is that I'm looking forward to heaven every day. That's why Colossians 3 verses 1 through 4 refers to, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds. You know, when we start thinking about this in this perspective, it changes our attitudes, doesn't it? He says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things on the earth. Now, if we're earthly minded, if we're too earthly minded to be heavenly good, then we're, we've got a problem there. We can get wrapped up and tangled up in the world so far. And I know we have jobs, we have things we fulfill. We can have recreation entertainment. But don't, Yet that is the focus of your life. Your focus is on heaven. And whenever we lose that perspective, we fail to embrace the promise of God like we should of heaven. It's also by intentional effort to embrace God's promises. Have you ever thought about that? I need myself. And each one of us has to come to this conclusion that I'm going to embrace this promise. It means to take it into my life. To say this is what I'm for and what I'm, I'm all about. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, 10 through 12 says this. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name. That you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish. Now he's warning us for a reason because there's times we can become sluggish. 
but imitate. He says, but don't be like that, but do this. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. If you want to know what it takes to inherit the promise of God, it's not by lackadaisical attitudes. It's not by working slow in the kingdom, but by diligent effort, intentional effort in God's kingdom to embrace the promises of God. And grow in faith and trust. Hebrews 11 verse 33 says this. About those. And actually he's at the bottom of. He's actually about to conclude chapter 11 by saying. About those who through faith conquered kingdoms. Enforced justice. Obtained promises. Stop the mouths of lions. You know how to obtain promise? It's not by lack of faith. But it's by full faith and trust in God. That what he says he will do. That heaven is a real place. You can hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But it's only by faith when we get there. And not participating in sinful conduct is one way we do this. In 2 Peter chapter 3, take your Bible and turn over there if you will. 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter reminds us this world is not going to last forever. That this world is not our home. That we're just passing through. Verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be dissolved or destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in, in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hasten the coming of, of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But verse 13 kind of shows us about this promise, doesn't it? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. If we are corrupted by the world, if we let sin overtake us and we do not repent of that, we are participating in the sinful calling. We will not receive that prize that way. St. Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1, we already read, it says, Therefore, having these promises, will let us cleanse ourselves from all filters of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Obey the gospel. And you know, this is probably the first point we'll make about this is that we have to be a Christian, first of all. But I, I think in this lesson today, we're talking about people who have embraced in the promises of God. If you're not someone who's done that, then you need to do that because that's exactly what the Bible teaches us we need to do. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached the first gospel sermon, the Bible says about those Jews that when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. This day of Pentecost was not just a Jews only, you might say, promise of salvation. Some people make that into two plans of salvation. No, the same promise was for the Jews as also for the Greeks. The Gentiles will be grafted in as Acts chapter 10 and 11 referred to that as well. But they did it the same way, didn't they? By obeying the gospel. In Acts chapter 13, Paul preached. And they, they found him there. He was preaching about this, about Jesus, who God raised from the dead, was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses to the people. We declare you glad tidings, in other words, the gospel. That promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children. And that is raised up Jesus, as is also written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Here Paul is speaking about Christ, who is the one who is, leads us to the salvation made by the seed of Abraham. Finally, I want to say this. 
What happens if we don't? Have you ever thought about that as well? That's a sobering question. What if we don't embrace the promises of God and say, oh, that's for other people, not for me? Have you ever had somebody say that to you? That Christianity is good for some people, but not for me? They're saying, I'm not embracing the promises of God when they say that. If we live for the pleasure of sin, we absolutely will not receive the promises of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That promise of inheritance is lost to people who want to sin and live in sin. It says, Do not be seen, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That promise is something they'll never receive because of their sin, because of their love of sin. We can fall short of the promise. I'm speaking now to Christians, aren't we? You know, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 is a warning to Christians. He says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear. In other words, Beware, lest any seem to have to come or to have come short of it. How is that possible? I thought once we become a child of God, we can never lose our salvation. That's what some people teach, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we can fall short of the promise of God to entering that rest. You might think, what's Deuteronomy 34 have to do with this? I want to remind you, Moses did not get to enter in to that first rest, did he? He was the one that was taking the people to the promised land because of the sin, not sanctifying God in front of the eyes of the people. And uh, the sin he did there, the water strife, he was not allowed to go into the promised land. Now, he was allowed to see it. In Deuteronomy 34, he was on Mount Nebo when he got to see the promised land. Now, I don't want to say that Moses was lost. But, you know, one thing, he did not get an enter in that physical land of Canaan. But he got to saw it. He got to see it. What about if we don't make it? You know, you maybe thought about this. I've thought about this as well. What if we're not going to make it, but we get to see it? You know, at the day of judgment, we may actually get to see what heaven looks like and from a distance, like Moses did, and not be able to go inside of it, to enter in. And that'd be sad, wouldn't it? To see that wonders of heaven, but yet to be excluded from the promise of God of entering in. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 says, We have no hope in the judgment day if we do not embrace the promises of God. He's speaking to Gentiles here that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. That's our lot as well outside of Christ. The Gentiles, they abandoned God in the Old Testament. But yet, we can abandon God today by not embracing the promises of God in our lives today. Hope that that's not the case with us. That we are ready to serve God and fully work for Him so that the promises of God are for us as His people today. Thank you very much for your kind of attention to the lesson of the hour. We're now prepared for our Bible studies.